In this video, I will be covering the use of flamethrower drones in Ukraine, as well as a further analysis of the use of flamethrowers in modern combat. This video is part 2 of my previous video on flamethrowers. Please watch the first video if you haven't already, as I will be referencing certain ideas and topics that I have already covered. If you are already familiar with the basics of flamethrowers, logistics, and terrain and circumstance of flamethrower use, all the topics I covered in the first video, then please keep on watching. If not, I mean, I can't stop you from watching, but I would highly appreciate not leaving me like a three paragraph comment bringing up counterpoints that I literally already addressed word for word in my first video. Just saying. So enough yapping and let's start off with flamethrower drones in Ukraine. Now, the reason why I didn't bring up flamethrower drones in my first video is simply because they are very rare and experimental. From all the reports that I have seen, and as far as I am aware, they are still highly experimental. That being said, it is a good conversation to be had, which is why I wanted to discuss it in this video amongst other things. The existence of flamethrower drones further proves the point that I was making in my previous video, that the idea, the idea of flamethrowers are still relevant and effective, and that the limitations of its use in Ukraine as well as other modern day battlefields, certain modern day battlefields, is due to the terrain and circumstance. Let me put it this way. No drone operator woke up one day to find out that mommy and daddy drone had a new offspring with flamethrower capabilities. Instead, someone clearly had to have said, Hey look, there are situations right now where a flamethrower capable drone would have come in useful. Therefore, we should try to assemble one or at least experiment with them. Someone built a flamethrower drone for a reason, not because of a happy accident. So with these quote unquote flamethrower drones, we see two main variants in Ukraine. The first one is a drone with some sort of incendiary grenade strapped to it, nicknamed a dragon drone, and is essentially used by flying over enemy territory repeatedly and trying to set tree lines or other defenses on fire. Now, this first variant I won't spend much time on as they aren't really flamethrowers. I've seen videos of these in action. Oh, and, and a side note, I'm not going to show like full combat footage due to YouTube's guidelines. I'll just show a screenshots of what I'm talking about. And these drones, while of course carrying incendiary devices, aren't really comparable to the types of flamethrowers I'm talking about when compared to what an infantryman would carry. From the videos I've seen, they are mainly used to set tree lines on fire so that the enemy has less cover and concealment. And this is done by having, again, a drone strapped with some kind of thermite or incendiary grenade fly back and forth the tree line to start fires. The context of flamethrowers I talked about in my previous video is for the purpose of directly tackling dugouts and entrenched positions, which this first variant plays a more passive role in. However, there is a drone that has a similar role to a traditional flamethrower, at least on paper, an actual flamethrower drone. This second variant is still very rare, but much closer to what you would imagine a flamethrower to be. However, these drones are used to primarily fight other drones. Of course, they can also be used to clear out entrenched positions and dugouts if they really had to be, but there is a reason for why you don't really see them used for this purpose. This is not a zero-sum game. This is not a choice between having a flamethrower drone or no drone at all. This is not a zero-sum game. Drones and skilled drone operators are in high, high demand from both sides. One drone can essentially do the observation work of an entire reconnaissance team, with much less effort and risk. Drones can be used to drop explosives or turn into FPV drones carrying much higher payloads. Drones are also frequently lost in combat through many, many ways, from literally being used as an FPV drone to being lost to things like electronic warfare, enemy fire, user error, and so forth. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is a war of attrition where there can never be enough supply of drones in contrast to demand. In other words, both sides cannot afford to waste these precious drones. If you use a light drone, a drone that cannot carry that heavy of a payload, then you are limited in the fuel that you can carry as well as the weapon system on that drone. That is, if you are using it as a flamethrower drone, limiting both how long you can utilize it and the range and intensity of the flamethrower. If you use a drone capable of carrying a heavy payload, the question isn't whether or not it can be turned into a flamethrower drone. As long as the resources are there, obviously the answer is yes. The better question to ask is if there is a better use for the drone. Drones capable of carrying heavy payloads are in especially high demand. However, the general rule is that the lower a drone flies, the more vulnerable it is to either electronic warfare, if they don't have like a fiber optic cable, I mean at least for now, or direct enemy fire. If you fly a flamethrower drone low to flush out an entrenched position, that drone is much more vulnerable to just about everything I mentioned. Sure, if you have a surplus of drones or more drones than you know what to do with, then the issue is minimized, as you can just replace it. But 
In a war of attrition in which drones are already in high demand, losing an expensive and valuable piece of equipment is especially not ideal. But more so, a drone can be repurposed for many different roles that not only puts it at less risk than if it were to be turned into a flamethrower drone, but there are also roles that still need to be filled by that drone, which takes priority over using that drone as a flamethrower operator. Why use the Baba Yaga drone with a flamethrower when it can be better used to drop explosives? A role which is not only effective, but puts the equipment itself at less risk. As for lighter drones, you are not only carrying significantly less fuel for that flamethrower, limiting your ability to actually engage the targets, but these drones can be better used to take out other drones than to literally shoot into a dugout. A light drone also has the same vulnerabilities I just mentioned, but again can also be better repurposed for different tasks. In other words, sure, let's say I have a light drone with a flamethrower on it, with only a few seconds worth of flames. Also keep in mind that even infantry carry portable flamethrowers only have about like 10 seconds worth of flames which is not that much right never mind one strapped to a drone so what is better use of my time and resources shooting my limited amount of flamethrower fuel into an enemy dugout while exposed to more enemy countermeasures or using that same limited fuel on enemy drones and uavs what is better use of my time and resources modifying an expensive high demand heavy drone to carry around a flamethrower with more fuel sure but it has to fly low to the ground to attack enemy fortifications while being exposed to enemy fire and electronics warfare or using that same drone to drop various explosives anti-tank mines and so forth all while staying at relatively safer distances from being taken out by the enemy again it is not as if there isn't a use for flamethrower drones that's not what i'm saying there are many 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 uses i can think of for a flamethrower drone and i'm sure in the future we will see more of these drones on the battlefield it is just that in the current situation we see in ukraine at least for now both sides are burning through their drone supplies and while both sides are of course getting replaced Placements for these destroyed drones, resources are not infinite. The allocation of drone operators and drones means that certain drones, such as an FPV drone or one modified to have explosive dropping capabilities, takes priority over that same drone being used and turned into a flamethrower one. But this begs the question, what advantages does a flamethrower have over other weaponry? And what do modern day soldiers have to resist against this? This is adding on to what I was talking about in my previous video on this subject. So again, if you still haven't seen that video, video, it would be really, really helpful to watch that one first. Flame resistant clothing. The reason why I didn't directly address flame resistant clothing issued in the military in my previous video is that it is completely irrelevant. If someone put on oven mitts and then jumped into a blast furnace, was it worth me mentioning that they had oven mitts on? The point of flame resistant or frog gear is so that if you're in an environment where you are surrounded by flames, such as like a burning vehicle hit by an IED, it would offer you some minor protection, sure, but mainly so that you don't have molten synthetic fiber dripping all over your body. Flame resistant clothing and gear is not meant for you to go toe to toe with a flamethrower. Frog gear is completely useless against the flamethrower, shooting napalm or other form of modern thickened substance. And more so, let me ask you a question. In the example I gave in the first video where you are in a pillbox, what part of your body would most likely be hit with a flamethrower if you were to be hit with a flamethrower? Your face and eyes. Even if you have frog gear on that was completely invulnerable to flamethrowers, which is not, it doesn't exist by the way. But Fine, let's just say you did and it covered your entire torso. It still doesn't stop the fact that the most vulnerable part of your body and the part most likely to be hit with the flamethrower first if you're in a pillbox or bunker or some sort of entrenched position is your face and your eyes. Someone brought up how firefighters have entry suits or fire resistant clothing. Yeah, no one is going to wear that in combat. I'm sorry. Like putting on all that shit for the chance of encountering a flamethrower is ridiculous not to mention like hiking with it humping with it carrying it around and actually just wearing that stuff along with all your gear i don't think it's even possible now i don't know if the person who brought it up was joking but i figured i would mention it because someone is going to ask why marine soldiers whoever can't just wear firefighter stuff also firefighter stuff is flame resistant it is not fireproof even if it was somehow 100% fireproof, which it isn't, there's still the problem of having no oxygen, unless you also want to carry around like an oxygen tank, which, I mean, at that point, you might as well just become a firefighter, right? I mean, even then, firefighters are still not flamethrower proof. So now I hope we are all on the same page about how a modern day soldier or Marine does not have anything remotely rated to stop a flamethrower, at least nothing that they can wear on their body and have it be reasonable. Now let's specifically talk about how flamethrower is different from other ways of taking out enemies that are fortified. The range of a flamethrower versus alternative options. 
The Chinese Type 74 flamethrower has a range of about 45 to 70 meters, with ranges as far as 100 meters. All of this, of course, depends on terrain, fuel mixture, elevation, and so forth. So for the sake of this discussion, I'll just put the range of the modern flamethrower at a conservative estimate of 50 meters. Now, in regards to tackling enemy fortifications, keep in mind that the current use of satchel charges or modified anti-tank mines to destroy dugouts and other fortified positions, as I discussed in my first video, is obviously a risky task. The advantages of a flamethrower beyond the effect of the flame itself is the fact that you do not have to sit right next to an enemy fortification to destroy it. There is a reason why that scenes in war movies, right, if you watch an a or a soldier, marine, whoever, runs up to the enemy pillbox with explosives in their hands is always depicted at this heroic moment. The task of running up to an active and fortified enemy position, a pillbox, a bunker, a trench, or whatever, even when suppressed, is extremely dangerous. Running up to an enemy fortification while holding up a satchel charge, throwing in the explosives, and then running away while trying not to get hit by crossfire, booby traps, right, mines, the defenders themselves, all while not having the ability to respawn in real life is scary. So someone might look at a flamethrower with say 50 meters of range and conclude that eh, it's not that big of a deal. I mean 50 meters is, is not much at all. But that's 50 meters that someone under fire does not have to run. And technically it's over 50 meters because I mean once you run to the place and throw in your explosives you gotta run away and get to cover. And depending on where you place the explosive you might have to run all the way back. Also, a satchel charge or other form of throwable explosive can be thrown back out. Of course, it's easier said than done in real life, but this is a risk as the fuse for a satchel charge burns longer in order for the user of the satchel charge to get away in a safe distance. Satchel charges can of course be thrown alongside grenade satchel charge combo variants, but throwing a satchel charge itself has limited range as satchel charges aren't exactly something you can lob 50 meters away. Also, satchel charge is modified to be more quote unquote throwable also have a less explosive payload as they hit a compromise between explosive potential and weight. And of course, every equipment and weapon in real life has its drawbacks. But the point I'm making is that the flamethrower's further range than its alternatives and its inability to be countered effectively once deployed at the target. I mean, I don't think you can start scooping up globs of burning flamethrower fuel and start throwing it back at the enemy gives it a clear advantage. Now, satchel charges, of course, still have their place on the battlefield. I'm not denying that, nor is that what I'm trying to say. This is simply a response to people who say, well, why even use flamethrowers when you have satchel charges and other forms of explosives? This leads me to one more very important point about flamethrowers. Flamethrower saturation and suppression. I've spent a lot of time talking about how flamethrowers are used versus dugouts or pillboxes or bunkers, but how about flamethrowers in the open? Of course, this is no longer playing as much into the strengths of a flamethrower, but the idea that flamethrowers don't have a purpose or much effect when used in the open is just wrong. In World War I during the Battle of Huj, Germans used flamethrowers that caused complete chaos in the British lines. And contrary to some misconceptions, this was not the first time flamethrowers were used in World War I. The British already knew about the existence of German flamethrowers. It wasn't as if the technology itself was unseen. So why the panic? Well, it's burning flames. Okay. Look, the big thing is I'm not going to armchair general if I can help it. It's easy to say, oh, well, if I spot a flamethrower in combat, I'll just, you know, trace back the flames. I'll pick off the operator. Easy. It's another to have to actually do that in reality. And remember what I talked about in my first video about how modern combat is still relatively close quarters, at least when it comes to combat between conventional infantry versus conventional infantry. Flamethrower doctrine, at least for countries that still use the flamethrower like China, is to get operators within effective range of their flamethrowers. Of course, all of this is being done well supported by other infantry or other combined arms providing suppression and fire support. And when the flamethrower operators are within effective range, to unleash a coordinated blast of flames along the front line, prioritizing fortifications and then other defenses like trenches, then to quickly follow this up with an infantry assault. Some might see this doctrine and call it unrealistic and say that you know, flamethrowers would never get that close to an enemy position in a modern war, but we see in Ukraine that this is simply not true. The vast majority of infantry assaults turns into battles with close distances, with combat often ending up within hand grenade, shouting, and even at times hand-to-hand -hand combat distance. Now, this is a generalization, right? Everything I say has exceptions, but the main point that I'm talking about here is that there are plenty of combat scenarios that we can see 
in real life, right? Not just on paper, that engagement distances end up being within the effective range of a flamethrower. Meaning that while the range of a flamethrower is limited, no one's denying that, it is not impractical. If you are a defender in a firefight and then suddenly your entire front line erupts with flames, like what we saw in the Battle of Huj. It's easy to say that, oh man, I'm just gonna stand there, I'll hold my ground, I'll shoot those operators, no hesitation, until you are the one that's actually going to burn alive. And I'm included in this too. Flamethrower operators also wear some sort of heat resisting cream or like face coverings to shield themselves from the heat of the weapon that they are using, never mind being on the receiving end of it. Even if the enemy flames miss you completely, it cannot be fun feeling the heat of the flames and knowing that the next one might be on you. Another point is the effect of flamethrowers on improvised enemy dugouts, like the ones we see in Ukraine, which are typically a combination of logs, waterproof tarps, camouflage foliage, none of it being flamethrower proofed. While shooting into the entrances or the openings of a fortification and dugout is the most effective way of eliminating or flushing out the defenders, it is not the only way. A flamethrower operator can essentially spray flames alongside the top of an enemy trench, coating the entire area with burning fuel. Any fuel that hits the improvised enemy position, such as a dugout topped by logs and tarps like we see in Ukraine, are not rated for a flamethrower which would quickly destroy the waterproof tarp on top and the burning jelly would seep its way down to the defenders hiding below. And while not as effective as a direct blast of flames into the entrance, I don't think the people in the dugout are exactly going to be waiting around and seeing if their dugout, now hosed down by burning fuel, is going to actually burn them alive or not. And I keep saying this, right? But it's easy to say, I'll just hold my position, I'm not worried, I'll just... It's another to actually be in that position. So in summary, a flamethrower has its use as a shock element to shatter the enemy morale alongside directly taking out enemy fortified positions. And its use in doctrine is not this crazy impractical thing that some people might say. And please, for the love of God, I've said it like three times now, I know. Please watch my first video, if you haven't already, to get into the specifics of how a flamethrower takes out a fortified position and how effective it does it, if you're gonna leave any comments on its effects. I want to make more videos of military tactics and just other history related videos in the future, alongside my usual gaming videos, which I also enjoy making. So, please stay tuned if you're interested and consider liking and subbing if you haven't already, no pressure of course, just saying. And thank you for watching and making it to the end, and bye.